So welcome everyone to the Learn About Transit webinars presented by the Transit Action Alliance of Guelph. Um, today's uh, webinar is Understanding the Basics of Transit Scheduling or Understanding Basic Transit Scheduling Concepts. Um, if you ever wondered how transit schedules are created, what information schedulers use to build efficient schedules and uh, what they may must take into account when creating a schedule, well, you're going to find out about this and a lot more on this webinar. So first, uh, we want to introduce who we are at TAG. We are a uh, broad-based nonprofit community organization, which is aiming to make public transportation frequent, accessible, and affordable for all in Guelph. We are advocating for frequent, accessible, and affordable transit. And our goals are to educate, advocate, motivate, and activate the community on transit. We have uh, memberships available for $10 for individuals, five for students and seniors, uh, community groups and nonprofits, $25, corporations, unions for $100. We also take donations as well. You can find that all on our website at tagguelph.com slash join. You can follow us on uh, social media. We're on Facebook, on um, our website, uh, tagguelph.com, on Twitter, and we also have a newsletter on Substack, which is tagguelph.substack.com. So that's uh, what we're uh, advocating for, a public transit system that is in Guelph where fares are fair, frequency provides freedom, and no rider is left behind. So our speaker tonight is Dennis Fletcher. Dennis is an experienced transportation planner with more than 30 years experience in the transit industry. He specializes in community-based transit and transportation solutions that have emphasize innovation, coordination, and mobility. Dennis has an extensive transit planning, operations, and project management experience for fixed route and specialized transit projects, derived from a range of positions held in the transit and consulting sectors. He has a successful track record communicating complex ideas and developing excuse me, developing consensus around innovative solutions with transit agencies, including extensive public and stakeholder engagement components. Dennis is a member of the board of directors of the Canadian Urban Transit Association, sits on his governance committee, and is an active member of the Accessible Transit Committee. So without further ado, I'm going to send this over to Dennis. Dennis, you have to unmute. I was saying, uh, Bob, I'm, I'll flip through the slides if you just want to take over the presentation from here. So, because I, I think you've probably seen some of this material uh, material before. Uh, anyway, welcome everyone and thanks uh, for joining us this evening. Um, in tonight's session, I want to spend about, uh, about 30 minutes uh, covering the basic scheduling process, some terminology, uh, the key inputs and how they're derived, and then talk about when and how things go wrong and the ways that those problems can be addressed. Then we'll save the uh, rest of the time for discussion. So it's a lot to cover. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, we're already late, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move ahead. So in my experience, the customer needs and operational requirements can be summarized in a single formula that looks like this. This is uh, simpler than it looks. It, it, when you expand it algebraically, it gives you this, uh, which is simply just another way of saying that we wanna be where we say we're going to be when we say we're going to be there. That's the fundamental tenet of scheduling. The customer though, has one more expectation. And that's once I'm on the bus, get me where I wanna go as fast as you can. So it's just that simple, but simple is not a synonym for easy. So let's take a look at the process and some of the, some of the details. The overall service planning and implementation process that most agencies adhere to looks generally like this. Agencies vary, but most go through this process about four times a year. 
to implement seasonal changes. It begins with data collection, then service design and the scheduling process, and then a variety of administ administrative tasks, and then it starts all over again. The scheduler is directly involved or responsible for designing the service, which includes working with planners to get, sorry, I just let somebody in there, uh, to working with planners to get the correct inputs, building the timetables, and blocking, which is the process of assigning vehicles to the routes. It also, it also includes run cutting, which is the process of assigning drivers to the buses. But this is a process that's usually transparent to the customer, so we won't be dealing with it a, a lot in this, uh, in this session. Okay, let's spend a couple minutes on some, I, on some terms that are key to the process uh, and to my discussion. So for schedulers, a route is made up of a series of nodes, key points along the route where times are established and checked. So usually these nodes are about five to 10 minutes apart and they're located at key intersections, transfers, turns, major destinations and terminals. Some schedulers will refer to some nodes as control points or nodes where a specific time is set. These are used to establish timed transfers or key destination points. Recovery time is a critical element of, of scheduling. Recovery time is an amount of time added at one or both ends of the route. This buffer allows time for a bus and operator to get back on time for the next departure. As a rule of thumb, it's usually about 10% of the trip time, but it may be different. And it may be combined with layover time to achieve the control times, time transfers, that sort of thing. Running time is the amount of time it takes to go from A to B between nodes and over the whole route. And headway is the scheduled interval between buses. Okay, so there are lots of formulas that planners and schedulers use in the process, but this one is critical to understanding how route design and schedules work. This says that the cycle time is equal to the number of vehicles on a route, V, times the headway, H. So what's cycle time? Cycle time is the running time for the round trip plus the recovery time at each end of the route. It's also called the round trip time. So it's the time that a bus takes to go from one end of the route to the other, wait, turn around, come back, and wait again, ready to go back on the, on the next trip. Our formula for cycle time presents a couple of key constraints. First, cycle time must be a multiple of the headway. If you remember your grade four math, you remember that the equal sign means if you make a change on one side of the equation, you have to make an equivalent change on the other side. So what happens if you need more time because of congestion or to accommodate a route extension or a, some other change? If cycle time increases, then the formula requires an increase in headway, vehicles, or a combination of both to make the equation work. Second, for the most part, V, vehicles, must be an integer, a whole number, because you can't put 2.3 buses on a route. Now, I know Bob's going to tell you, to, uh, suggest that, well, maybe you can, and you can certainly put a half a bus uh, on the route, but let's just go with this for now. So, building a schedule means answering five basic questions. Where do we go? How long does it take? When do we start? How often do we go? And when do we finish? So let's take a little closer look at each one. And as we do, I want you to consider which of these questions is the most important and which question is the hardest to answer when building a schedule. Uh, spoiler alert, those are both the same question. So where do we go? 
the geography of, of a route is more the domain of planners, but planners and schedulers need to work together to make sure that the route is the correct length to be efficient and that branch points and terminals are correctly located. It's all about that key formula for cycle time. How long does it take? Schedulers and planners, often working with operators and supervisory staff, will determine the travel time between successive nodes. This timing has to consider posted speed, traffic conditions, the variability of that delay, traffic signals, the number of stops along the route, the expected passenger activity, and the variability in that activity at each stop. Determining the correct running time Determining the correct running time is the most critical element of the schedule and the source of most of the scheduling issues. So here's the problem with determining running time. Things change and people are different. Throughout the day, throughout the peaks, even from trip to trip, traffic conditions and demand patterns can change. Weather conditions seasonally and even daily can change and affect the running times. Operators are humans and each one is different. Each one drives a little differently and responds to events differently. So we'll come back to the running time issue in just a minute. So when do we start, when do we finish? Start and finish times are also the domain of service planners and are set based on a balance of demand patterns and financial constraints. In many smaller systems with pulse schedules meeting at a common terminal, service typically starts at the same time on each route. But in larger systems, routes may start and finish at different times. Start and finish times not only refer to the start and finish of the service in the morning and at night, schedulers also need to know when service levels change throughout the day, like at the end of the AM peak hour or the start of the PM peak hour. Schedulers also need to decide how to build a service at the start of the day. Does the AM peak service start at the beginning of service or does it build from the early morning into the peak? Does service begin at one end of the route and build through the route? Or does it start at each end point so that the service begins in each direction around the same time? Does service be begin, part of the service begin at midpoints along the route. All of these questions are determined by the scheduler and the decisions that are to be made are as many as there are buses on the route. Each bus has to have an in-service time, each bus has to have an out-of-service time and point, and the scheduler has to make all of these, all of these decisions. So how often do we go? The level of service on a route or the headway is sometimes determined by demand, sometimes by policy, and sometimes by either one, depending on the route. Both are usually influenced by financial constraints. Virtually all systems have a mix of both of, of these policy headways and, uh, and demand-based headways. Even small systems will have, uh, you know, might have 30-minute service during the peaks and 60-minute service in the, uh, in the evenings. So that's our five questions. Building a schedule though is all about compromise. Some of the variability in the running times that we've talked about is predictable. And with modern scheduling software, it, it might be theoretically possible to build a schedule that accounts for a multitude of variability and addresses all the possible changes on a day by day, trip by trip basis. The result would be a schedule that is more accurate and operationally efficient, but complicated and incomprehensible to both the customer and the driver. So some schedulers now will argue that real-time apps and online trip planners make create a situation where schedules can be more complicated because the app does the work for you, for the customer. But not everyone has access to apps and trip planners all the time. And people want to be able to just understand how the system works. 
So the scheduler creates a compromise, a schedule that is as accurate and efficient as possible while still being easy to understand and use by both passengers and drivers. And of course, every compromise has trade-offs between the two sides of the balance. The more si simple a schedule is, the likely it is that it is less efficient. And the more efficient it is, the more likely it is that it's a complex schedule that's more difficult to understand. So let's take a look at our questions again in the context of a Guelph transit route. For this example, I've picked the Northwest Industrial Service Route 20. So first of our questions, where do we go? Route 20 operates from the Central Station in downtown up to the Northwest Industrial Park. At, at the, to the um, Imperial Galaxy uh, Cinema and then returns back to downtown. Most of the route is a, is a large loop. At the, the end in the northwest corner is a large loop, and it also loops coming into and out of, uh, out of downtown using, uh, using different, different routes to get there. So how long does it take? The outbound trip is 30 minutes. The current online schedule shows a stop time for every stop along the route. The nodes that I've picked here in this, in this table are those that were used on the previous printed version of the schedules. I think this one is from 2018, um, but it's essentially the same, uh, the same today. As you can see in the table, the trip times between nodes vary from uh, four minutes to about to six minutes to nine minutes. And the nodes are located at recognizable places along the route. The inbound trip takes 19 minutes with four intermediate nodes. But then the bus has 11 minutes in the terminal before starting its next trip. So let's take a look at this. As I mentioned, all routes need recovery time in their schedule to account for the variability in the route and to accomplish the compromise we've been talking about to create a schedule that's easier to understand at the expense of efficiency. The total trip time is 49 minutes, 30 minutes out and 19 minutes back. The, and the schedule needs some recovery time. Typically using the 10% rule, this would be about five minutes, but it may be more. But remember the formula? The cycle time must be a multiple of the headway, which in this case is 30 minutes. So our next multiple of 30 is 60. And so the scheduler has to add 11 minutes to get the cycle time from 49 to 60 minutes. We could make a schedule that was more efficient by adding only say five minutes but then the cycle time would be 54. And with two buses, the headway would need to be 27 minutes. So uh, with uh, all of the other system operating at 15s and 30 minutes, uh, this route operating on 27 minutes would, have, would miss all its connections. And it would also be very difficult to understand because at 27 minutes, the times of the trip would change in each hour. The only way to keep the headway at 30 minutes is to figure out how to assign 1.8 buses to the route. So when a scheduler builds the schedule, they must also determine how to split the available recovery time between the route terminals. They take into account the potential for the delay in each direction, the availability of a suitable place for the bus to wait, and the facilities that are available for the operator at that location. Ideally, there's at least some time at each end of the route. In the Route 20 example, we see that there is no time allocated for recovery at the, uh, at the Galaxy Cinema. So 
we also can see from the map that the galaxy cinema, if I find it right here, is not really at what you might think of as the end of the end of the route. So why is that? So first, the end of the route is a large loop. And loops are problematic for a scheduler because there's no defined end of the route. If a scheduler wants to add recovery time at some point, they must find a, a point where the bus is empty to avoid delaying passengers. That's a point where all outbound passengers have alighted and no inbound passengers have boarded. On a large loop, that's in practice just about impossible. So no recovery time is added and all the time is saved for the central terminal, which also works because that's where the operator facilities are. So next, if there's not going to be any recovery time at, at this point, the bus isn't going to be waiting anywhere along, uh, along the route, why not pick a point that looks more like the end of the route, like the corner of Governor's Road and Malcolm Road? The cinema is used because of the time that the bus arrives there, and more people likely know where the imperial, where the cinema is uh, than an intersection in an industrial park. So it makes the schedule easier to understand. So when do we start and finish? Route 20 uses two vehicles, so the scheduler has two choices to make. In this case, one bus starts at 5.45 in the morning at each end of the route, and they travel towards each other, uh, meeting somewhere in the middle. How often do we go? Service on Route 20 operates on a 30-minute headway or two vehicles per hour. This service is maintained all day long. And we'll come back to that issue in, in a minute. So that's our five questions answered. And with that, we have, sorry, we have our timetable. So what about when things go wrong? From a passenger's perspective, there's two principal areas where a schedule runs, runs into trouble. First, my bus is early and I missed it. Maybe my bus was on time, but my connecting bus at the transfer point left early. Either way, I'm going to be late. So early buses can result from three factors, incorrect running time, delays in the bus ahead, and operator behavior. If the trip time between a node is too long, buses can easily run early. Driver information systems will tell a driver when they're ahead of schedule, but the demands of passenger service and safe driving can make paying close attention to a clock more difficult. Also, many display systems in buses only have a colored indicator, not a clock, and many have a buffer built in, so accuracy is sometimes sacrificed. If a driver gets ahead of schedule, there's two options to correct, drive slower or wait at stops. Some operators are better at this than others, and onboard passengers hate both options. I mentioned leading bus delay. How can a delay in the bus ahead make a bus behind early? Hold that thought and we'll come back to it. Second, my bus is late and I waited a long time for it. Maybe my first bus was on time, but my connecting bus at the transfer point was late. Either way, I'm going to be late. This one is a lot more common and has many more causes. Late buses can be caused by unusual traffic congestion, I, and I say unusual because schedulers can account for traffic con congestion that happens all the time. Passenger crowding at a stop can delay a bus because it takes more time to board passengers, and passenger boarding takes longer as a bus gets crowded, making things even worse. Passengers arriving with unusual patterns at stops are also a factor. Many routes have stops that are not frequently used, but on some days, it seems that every stop has people waiting or wanting to get off. I'm not sure if it's true that this typically happens when you're already late for an appointment. Detours, both planned and unplanned, can 
simply cause havoc on a route. Third, my bus never showed up. I was there before the scheduled time and I waited till the next bus arrived and the driver said he was on time. My bus just disappeared. In reality, buses rarely just disappear mid route. Although sometimes breakdowns can create the impression that they do. More likely your bus was really, really early or the schedule on the, the, the service on the route was in such chaos that there were large gaps created. And we'll talk about that in a minute. All of these factors contribute to be, buses being off schedule. The effective use of recovery time on a short on, on a route short circuits the problem to ensure that it does not build from one trip to the next, but it doesn't address mid route issues. So significant issues in a schedule can lead to a problem that I suspect we have all encountered as riders. Bus bunching. So how does this happen? Well, first, without supervisory intervention and given a combination of long routes and short headways, it can happen very easily. In fact, with these conditions and the inability of vehicles to pass each other, especially like with streetcars or trolleys, it's almost a mathematical certainty. Schedules are designed for a bus to stay at a set in buses to stay at a set interval apart. The headway and that interval is typically in part based on passenger demands. The running time is set on the amount of time that it takes to board and alight typical passenger numbers. But then a delay happens. Let's think about a route with a five minute headway where suddenly a bus gets delayed at a stop by one minute for any number of reasons. Lot, lots of passengers, a delay getting back into traffic, a signal delay, uh, could be a lot of things. Suddenly the interval between buses is not five minutes anymore. The bus is now six minutes behind the bus ahead of it, and it's four minutes ahead of the following bus. Two things happen in this case. First, at the next stops, passengers have now been arriving to wait for six minutes instead of five. At a busier stop, that means there's more passengers and boarding takes longer than it should. And now the bus is even later. Second, the following bus is now arriving at stops after only four minutes instead of five. And this means that fewer passengers have had the chance to arrive at the stop. So boarding takes less time. This tends to make the bus run a little faster and the interval between the two buses shortens. Over time, this process repeats itself several times. And if the route is long enough, the second bus catches up to the first. Let's look at an example. This is a simulation of a route with two buses. The buses are evenly spaced. They are four seconds apart and the route takes eight seconds to complete. Passengers are arriving at each stop, the little dots at the stop, at a rate of about one, uh, sorry, about three passengers in each bus interval. As long as the buses are not delayed, they stay on time. And the passenger boarding times and travel times stay consistent. Everyone's happy. But what happens if I delay one bus for about a second or a little less, which is about the same as a one minute delay on a route with a five minute headway. So now bus number one, the one I delayed, is arriving at the stops late, which means more passengers need to get on and at later stops get off. And so it takes longer. Bus number two is picking up fewer passengers because some of them have already got on bus number one. The result is bus two is catching up to bus one. Now, instead of four seconds apart, bus two is only three seconds behind and the gap in front of bus one is growing. The problem gets worse and worse 
until eventually bus two catches up to bus one. And the delays to bus one now means that the complete trip is taking more than 12 seconds instead of eight and bus two is stuck behind it. Instead of seven trips per minute, the buses are now only making five. From the passenger's perspective, two buses have disappeared. So what can we do in the moment to fix this? Supervisors or dispatchers will often try to prevent this problem as it is beginning to occur by slowing bus number two down to maintain the five minute interval. But when the route is already in trouble, this only partially solves the problem. If I slow bus two down to reestablish the interval, because bus one is still running very late, the problem just happens very quickly all over again. The real-time solution is to put a bus into the gap ahead of bus number one. So sometimes dispatchers have standby buses at their disposal to do just that. Sometimes they will short turn a bus going in the opposite direction into the gap. If, the, if that bus is empty, it's an effective solution. If not, there are unhappy customers on the short turn bus, but it's better to inconvenience a few and fix the problem than continue to in, inconvenience everyone. Or is it? It will depend on who you are in this scenario. Drivers will often try to minimize their delay as the following bus catches up by skipping stops or where passengers must stop to get off by asking waiting passengers not to board, but to board the bus coming right behind. Sometimes this works, and I'm sure you've seen it happen, but it always results in unhappy customers, at least temporarily. So what can we do to fix those problems? For early buses, the solution is almost always adjustments to running times, along with better communication to drivers and training to enhance on-time performance. For late buses, the solutions are almost as numerous as the causes, but we don't have always control all of them. Again, making sure running times are as accurate as possible is key to on-time performance. Another solution is transit priority. By introducing signal priority, queue jump lanes, and even bus lanes, traffic delays, and more important, the variability in those delays can be reduced. This also makes the trip shorter, which makes the transit more attractive to the passengers. Delays from detours can be unsolvable, but planned detours should not be a surprise to the transit agency and the drivers. Better interdepartmental communication within the municipality can avoid having the first driver on Route 1 suddenly discover that the approach to the mall planning solution, stop consolidation. Operation staff have an old saying, it would be easier to keep on time if we did not have to stop and pick people up. A stop that no one uses is not necessary, but it's also not really part of the problem since buses never stop there take it out and no one cares. What is a problem is a series of closely spaced stops with a few people using them. TransLink in Vancouver has just completed an exercise of looking in detail at stops along several routes and consolidated some of those stops, eliminating a stop where boardings were low and close to another stop. The result on some routes was a significant reduction in running time which makes the trip more reliable and faster. But passengers are affected when you do this. By definition, stop consolidation of low ridership stops affects a small number of passengers. For some, the location of the stop, whether for mobility needs or convenience, is a key factor in their decision or even in their ability to use transit. And consolidating stops put the, puts these passengers at risk. But reducing running time also has another positive effect. Remember the formula? 
So another way to read this is that for every reduction in cycle time that's equal to the headway, you can keep the same schedule with one less bus. Or you can keep, if you keep the same number of buses, you can improve service with shorter headways. Reliability also has the same effect. The more reliable a route is through transit priority and other measures, the less recovery time you need to account for variability in delays. And that can mean reductions in cost or improvements in service. But there's a limit to what you can achieve. And, and unfortunately, the greatest flexibility comes with the highest levels of service, usually not available to the scheduler in the small system. With 30 minute headways, your time savings have to amount to 30 minutes before the most significant savings kick in. And that's hard to do unless your route is very, very long. So the smaller system scheduler is faced with finding that balance between efficiency and simplicity. In cities like Guelph, that often means running a simple, a similar schedule all day long, despite knowing that traffic conditions and running time requirements change throughout the day. If a schedule is written to accommodate the worst case scenario in the peaks, it usually means there's too much running time in the evenings and in the weekends. But changing the schedule throughout the day or the week presents a challenge to the customers. And it's all part of achieving that desired balance between simplicity and comprehension versus accuracy and efficiency. That's about all I can cover in the time that we've got available to us. Um, we have a good bit of time left and I'd be happy, Steve, to uh, answer, any, uh, answer any questions. Thanks, Dennis, that was great. No. <laughs> uh, anybody has a Steve, I will I will give you the uh, the host back. All right. This is my uh, stop consolidation. Uh, uh, image, by the way, if you can't see the, um, the caption, it reads the, the old, the older woman is saying, I'm not stealing it. I'm moving it closer to my house. I think Steve, you're on mute, yeah? There we go. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> I love this thing. So if you have any questions, uh, you can go ahead and ask if you want or. Uh, hello? Oh. I think, I think Nathan has a, has a question. Let's see if I think he's on mute, eh? There we go. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, do you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see, I'm from Vancouver, BC, and uh, no, TransLink has not re achieved anything with their bus stop balancing. They copied from the States. Not they. It's not their program. Oh, no, and, no, it's uh, not. Uh, and uh, uh, they, they save two minutes on a 35 minute trip. That's all they achieved. And uh, uh, it's a bad, bad program. When our density in Vancouver is four times what it is in Tacoma, but Tacoma, Washington, they're taking 20% of the bus stop away. So that's a bad, bad way of discouraging passengers and not fulfilling their mandate. They can put express buses if they want to save time, but they don't want to do anything. They are just don't know what they're doing. It's a bad thing. I don't know, how did you hear about TransLink or whatever? But I, 
So, so, and, and yeah, I, I think, I think Nathan, that that's a good point. I, I have not gotten into the real details of the specific um, stop consolidation plan, or I guess TransLink is calling it stop balancing. Um, I, I, I haven't gotten into the real details and, and certainly no, and it's, it's not, you know, it's not something they invented. Uh, it's something planner, planners and schedulers work on all the time. Um, and it really does create uh, a trade-off between, um, and, and we run into this problem all the time. There are, you know, your, your passenger goes through two distinct phases of their trip. One is when they are a, a pedestrian and they're trying to get to the bus and access it at the stop, like the woman in the, in the picture here who wants the stop to be closer to her house. Um, and then when, the, when the, the, the pedestrian arrives at the stop and gets on the bus, they morph into this person who just wants the bus to go. I'm on, close the doors, button up and go. Let's not stop and, and pick and everybody up. And there really is this, this um, tension between those, those two phases when we want, we want the bus to be as close to people as we can, uh, which tends to make longer and slower routes, uh, but we also want the bus to be as fast as, as possible. Expresses are certainly an option to, uh, to, to, deal, uh, to deal with that, an overlay express. TTC does that a lot, uh, where they have a local service operating along the arterial route, and then they put an express bus uh, on top of it, there's lots of different solutions as, as to how that can be uh, how that can be done. Um, and I, I guess really the point that I that I wanted to make was just about the the potential for uh, in a in a from a scheduling perspective, the the um, the the potential for delays at frequent un, uh, unused or lightly used stops. And um, but it really is a balance between between the two. Uh, Karen's got a question. Hi, Karen. Hi, Dennis. I've always wanted to take one of your courses, and here I am. Well, um, this is the first half hour of day one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I was just curious from a scheduling perspective, uh, you know, the, the challenge is always coverage versus frequency, but what are your top two strategies for uh, ridership recovery? Oh, in a, in a, co in a, well, you know, I, I, I think, I think from a, from a COVID recovery standpoint, um, I think we need to, the, the, the scheduling aspects of it don't really change. It's, it's, it's how we deploy uh, the buses. Uh, we heard if, if anybody was, uh, um, attended the APTA study mission to Canada last week, uh, we heard Rick Leary from TTC talking about how they're 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 looking differently at deploying uh, de deploying their bus hours and putting a lot more buses into than they would have normally uh, into the the hot spots and the vulnerable uh, the vulnerable communities. So that's a frequency thing. Uh, so you know we're we're taking those communities that have that are are still hurting and have you know taken the brunt of uh, of of the impact, and uh, and we are um, you know focusing the service and focusing the frequency in those areas. Frequency is also important, um, you know, to be able to maintain um, you know an appropriate level of of um, of distancing on the bus. You can never achieve a you know a six foot um, uh, six foot spacing of, of customers on a bus, you would only have a small handful of customers on, on each bus. I mean, it's something that that smaller systems, I mean, my my nearby transit system is is Brantford Transit. And, uh, you know, they, they don't often have crowded buses, except, you know, a few trips in the peaks and around school times, um, even pre COVID. So, you know, it's been easier for them. So and I think, generally speaking, it's been easier for those smaller systems, um, medium-sized systems like Guelph with a large uh, student component have lost, you know, a lot of ridership 
and those that are heavily rely, reliant on knowledge-based commuters have lost you know, a ton of their ridership and certainly Go Transit is, is, uh, is in that boat. So from a scheduling perspective, I, I, I don't think it's, um, you know, you're still going to, you're still going to schedule the, the services that you're, uh, that you're given. It's really a, a planning solution about how you, how you deploy the buses and how much service you keep on the street. Hey, Dennis, I got a couple of questions and maybe a few comments. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Okay. Um, uh, just, just for those that aren't aware, uh, Bob and I used to co-teach CUTA's scheduling course. Um, Bob was the run cutting expert on this, uh, and he is formerly the director of schedule, the former director of schedules for TTC, uh, now retired and working uh, part time in retirement as a Burlington Transit driver. So he uh, has seen both sides of the street, so to speak. Okay. Um, you mentioned about start times. Remember, you said mm -hmm. you were talking about smart times. Now, I'm assuming you're talking that you said that the scheduler is sort of uh, in charge of that. But if the scheduler and the planner are the same, I can see that. But it's, isn't, it, <laughs> yes. it, it, isn't it the planners really said, listen, I want to start my service at 550, 540, 530 and go from there? Yes. And and I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I thought I said that it's 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 partly the domain of the transit of the planner. So the planner is going to tell you the scheduler that the service has to start at about six o'clock or at about five o'clock. The scheduler is going to make the detailed decision based on how it's going to fit into the route that six o'clock really means 605 at the mall or it means 555 at the downtown terminal. Uh, but so it's the planner that makes that bigger picture uh, um, decision and the scheduler makes the very detailed decision there i put a plug in for the planner you can see i'm getting old <laughs> yeah really um the other thing is one of the things that you really really missed out and you should be really um uh, one of the the factors is called politics <laughs> in <laughs> creating a schedule <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm i'm trying to stay away from politics in these sessions bob Okay, but anyways, that's that's a big factor in some properties and stuff like that. So yeah, and and it's also one of the reasons and and that I introduce and part of the way that I introduce the um, uh, that equation about how cycle time because and and Bob, you've run into this and we often see this in 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 systems where where the the planners and the schedulers and often in small smaller communities are dealing with running time issues or they're dealing with the new uh, Canadian Tire or the Walmart that has gone in 400 meters down the road from the end of the route. Yeah. And the sense from the community and maybe sometimes from the council is, well, just go a little further. It's just two minutes down the road. And what's really important is to remember that that two minutes has to factor into that equation. And so if you add in two minutes up and two minutes back, your cycle time has now gone up by four minutes. Something on that other side of the equation, the vehicles and the headway has to change. And if you're only dealing with one or two buses, you can't change the number of buses. So you have to change the headway. And what often happens is a five minute extension results in an increase of, of an entire headway of the service, an extra 30 minutes being added into the route. A new, and a new bus is added, and a whole lot of inefficiency is added into the uh, into the service. Right. Um, the only other uh, uh, comment I had is is basically as far as a schedule goes, and you know um, that it's basically an average. Of, yes, that's the compromise. Yep. Yeah. It's it's a compromise. It's an average, and you're going to have some trips that are running early, some trips that are running late. Now, the only other thing that, that, that really is missing, and I found out whether I was in Toronto, whether I was in, you know, doing some work for Laval and, and, and uh, Chicago and all those things, they don't listen to reality. Some of the planners, not, okay, not, not you know, whatever, they don't listen to reality. The operations staff seems to have very, very little input into it and saying, look, we've got a problem here, guys. Well, our data doesn't say we have a problem. Oh, yes, we do. No, we don't. So I think uh, uh, a lot of the um, 
uh, uh, smaller properties or bigger properties or whatever you want to do. I think you got to listen to more, more to the uh, the operations end of it. And I'm glad you sort of went into you know uh, uh, we got a problem with a bus and this and that and you know we got bunching of buses and I'm glad that you're starting to get into maybe a little bit of uh, um, uh, reality, not reality, I should say, but operational and issues of how it affects the schedule, which I'm glad to see. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, you know, I, I think it's important to remember that the only person that sees all of this variability in the route and and, exa and exactly what's causing it is the operator. Um, and, you know, that the next person up the chain in terms of the level of detail and exposure to information is the dispatcher and and or maybe the the supervisor if the if the system even even has one those are really the the people that have the information about what the problem is how big the problem is and where it's what's causing it and and possibly what the uh, what the solutions are um, the only thing i will add is that, uh, and Bob, you brought up politics, um, is that there can be politics on the driver's side too. Oh, no, no question about it. <laughs> no question about it. I've been there, seen it, done it, you name it. Been, been it, yep. So. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Martin, Martin has a comment and question. I'm sorry, let me just find him on my list here so I can unmute him. <laughs> Hi, uh, you can hear me. I can't get the video on for some reason, but uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. Um, I, I, I know the, um, I guess a year or two ago, Steve, you might remember exactly when they did that pilot project for a bus lane on Gordon. Was that two years ago now? Uh, I guess, uh, just 2019, 2019, 2018. 2019. But it was just a very short uh, section, maybe from court right up to, uh, up to Stone Road and the drivers all went ballistic. The counselors said they never got so many, so much pushback about one brief <laughs> lane being taken away uh, from the drivers. So I, I'm thinking that's probably a long shot, hopefully not because I do believe it's the way to go. But I'm wondering on automated buses and robo taxis sometime in the, in the future, uh, I know TCC is doing a pilot project with them I'm not sure if it's underway yet, but it's coming up, I think. Uh, is that something that you see to help with that uh, calculation in terms of vehicles and uh, scheduling? Yeah, you know, it's a it's a good question. I think the simple answer is, I, I, you know, I don't know. Oh, we can see you now, Martin. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think as far as autonomous vehicles are concerned, I think the very first um, application we're going to see in buses, and it's going to be very soon, is in the yard and in the garage, um, especially with electric buses. Um, Nova, uh, who sells a lot of buses here in Canada, uh, is developing a system, I'm sure Flyer is too, uh, for garage management with autonomous buses so that the buses can hustle themselves get into proper parking location for charging, you know, leave the charging station when they're, uh, when they're fully charged and get into position uh, for the, um, uh, you know, for the, for the next service day. That kind of controlled environment is, is ideally suited to the level of automation that works right now. Um, and I think that's probably the first thing that we'll see, uh, that we'll see happening. As far as autonomous vehicles on the street, um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I have a hard time. I, I think it has to be in transit. I think the solution for autonomous vehicles has to be in transit. Um, I think autonomous vehicles in cars uh, just means that uh, people's personal vehicles are going to be driving around all day uh, waiting to pick them up. Um, I so, so I think, I think one of the only sensible solutions for autonomous vehicles is in transit. I think it's easy to picture what the end state looks like but it's really difficult for me anyway to picture what the transition looks like you know how do we get there in an environment where some buses are autonomous and some buses aren't and some automobiles are autonomous and some aren't 
Um, but there's lots of application uh, for autonomous vehicles, even electronic coupling, you know, in busy areas and through the downtowns, you couple the vehicles together electronically, they travel through, you know, a, a common corridor as a unit, and then they branch off, and the drivers take over again, um, you know, to, uh, to, to direct the route. So I think we'll see it very stepwise um, as the, as the technology matures, but I'm, you know, a, autonomous vehicles are, I, I don't know whether they're closer than people think, but they are certainly more present than people think, you know, in terms of tests and pilots and lots of programs going on. There's a lot of money being invested, certainly on the, on the vehicle side of things. I don't know if it's the same for buses, but I was sort of thinking last mile, first mile, last mile to get yeah. into those areas that are difficult to service. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, and, and we're starting to see that with the on-demand, uh, the, the on-demand right. programs, you know, for first mile, last mile, and low demand areas, and it's a fairly short step to take those from uh, from having a driver in the vehicle to having a uh, having an autonomous vehicle. Well, thank you very much. To be continued. <laughs> to be continued. Any other questions for? Uh... Yeah, yeah, Lorenzo Mele here. I, I had hi, a, Lorenzo. Hi, uh, Steve and Dennis. Dennis, thank you for the for the presentation. It was awesome. Um, I'm just curious about uh, the passenger experience. You know, the the user experience when we're designing transit routes. Um, as we're trying to emerge out of the the pandemic and trying to build ridership, what are your thoughts on? you know, how transit systems can, can maybe view their ideas around fares and, and revenue so that they expand that, so that they think about, you know, memberships in transit, bundling of other services. I think the pandemic presents a really unique opportunity for us. And I'm just wondering if, you know, user experience and design uh, has an answer for us in terms of building the ridership. Yeah, it's a good uh, it's a good question, uh, Lorenzo, and um, you know not specifically uh, uh, not specifically scheduling related, but but I think it's important. Um, you know, we've heard a lot in the last little while about you know certainly we've seen the the use of um, of, of phone apps growing, um, both in terms of trip planners and and the on demand uh, services that are that are growing, and I mean have started in in Guelph. Uh, you know, just uh, a week or so ago. Um, and, you know, Be um, uh, Paul Buck from Belleville has appeared in this space uh, talking about, uh, about their, uh, their program. So, so that's certainly, uh, certainly part, uh, part of it. Um, but I, I think that the, um, I, 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 and I've, I've kind of, just momentarily lost track of where I was, uh, where, where I was well, going. Is the, is the fixed route the app going to go away? Like, is this the idea fixed of the route, fixed route? Fixed, that's a good question. Uh, I think fixed routes are going to diminish. Yeah. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of very small systems. Um, you know, the orange vills um, and uh, you know, th those kinds of, you know, the, the one and two and five bus systems uh, a number of those are going to go on demand only, mm -hmm. um, you know, and probably uh, probably not fast enough, you know, if we'd had this solution a yeah. long time ago. Uh, you know, small towns are a horrible place to drive a bus around trolling for passengers, um, <laughs> you know, and just hoping that somebody comes up and catches <laughs> on. Um, so I think the on demand uh, component is is ideally suited to that. Um, Guelph is using it more in a, in a, you know, sort of geographical demand based, uh, sense where that, you know, they've replaced the community buses and the route 16, uh, with, with on demand Edmonton this week just launched, uh, their, uh, on demand service. They're probably the largest system in the country to have a fairly robust on demand component. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, they're doing the same thing. They've, as part of their, as part of their system redesign, they've kind of gotten out of the neighborhood business, and so they're focusing the fixed routes on those arterials. And I think in larger systems, 
there's always going to be a place, you know, starting with subways down to BRTs and, and LRTs. There's always going to be a role for that higher capacity corridor service operating on a, on a fixed route. But how we feed those services, I think, is, is going to change. And there's going to be uh, a fairly significant component of, of on-demand services and perhaps even autonomous uh, vehicles that are u- being used to see those feeders. Um, we've seen uh, just this week, it, actually, it's not approved yet. It's still before council in Winnipeg. Um, Winnipeg has redone their system to basically strip off all the branches and leaves uh, of the roots. Mm. So, so a route goes from A to, to uh, a high level top tier route goes from A to B. And their commitment is that that will never change. It may get a little bit longer, but it's never going to deviate. So if you, mm. if you build the new school or the apartment complex or the seniors home two blocks over, it's not going there. Yeah. And so what they're trying it's not to do, chase it, it's not going to chase those, right. Those so, destinations. So they're, they're in effect presenting their, their high level corridor routes as a rail service. Mm. It's, it's fixed. Mm-hmm. And all of the branches that used to branch off that route and go into neighborhoods are now separate feeders. Yeah. So the, the downside for the passenger is that you have to transfer, mm. but the frequency is such uh, that, you know, transferring onto the corridor route is, is, is very, very easy and simple. But, but that brings up, a, you know, another question about, you know, if it's not an on-demand service, lots of people, when they're looking at a transit service and they're thinking of how it operates, only think in one direction. So they think, well, I can get the neighborhood bus and, you know, I can sit, sit and sip my coffee until it's time for the neighborhood bus to come by. And then I can go out and I can get on the bus and it doesn't really matter what time I get out to the main street route because the buses run every four minutes mm-hmm. and, you know, they're just zooming by. Mm-hmm. That's great. On the return trip, it's not quite so easy <laughs> because you leave your office downtown, you get on any one of those, um, you know, 30 buses an hour that are, that are going by and they take you out to your stop where you catch your feeder bus into the neighborhood, but it only still operates every 20 minutes or every 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And if you just missed one, you're, you know, you're waiting for 20 minutes to, to get to the, uh, to the next one. If it's an on-demand service that can still work very, uh, very nicely. But um, you know, that's, that's the downside of this issue is making that connection between the two layers of, uh, of, of, uh, of service. I mean, Dennis, I'll point out that, you know, in, in uh, 20 minutes, you can, walk uh, at least two kilometers uh, at, a, at a good pace. So, some um, people can. And yeah, some people can if they're able. And, and I think it makes the case for, you know, uh, improving, you know, the pedestrian environment and so on, as you start consolidating uh, routes and, and, you know, getting into this stop creep thing that happens with politics. Anyway, thank you so yeah. much for the I, presentation. I think it, I really I think appreciate it has it. to be done. It has to be done very carefully. And it has to be presented very carefully. Edmonton, you know, mm-hmm. launching their redesign this week is at the end of a, oh, I don't know how long the process is, uh, but but our, um, our, our former minister of infrastructure was still a, a, um, a city councillor in Edmonton when it started. Um, you know, so that was a, that was a long time ago. Um, you know, it was two governments ago. Um, and the, the present, the, the, the arguments were kind of poorly presented and, and they were not, it, it wasn't done effectively. Uh, and I used the term earlier, getting out of the neighborhood business. That's essentially how the, it was perceived in the neighborhoods, that the neighborhoods were being abandoned. And it wasn't really true, uh, but for some people, it certainly was. And if you weren't capable of walking the uh, extra distance. And if ever you've been in Edmonton in the wintertime, you'll know that not everybody is capable of, of walking two kilometers at minus 40. Um, <laughs> it, uh, you know, it, 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 was, uh, it was a factor. And I think not enough attention was paid in the early generations of the plan to just how the neighborhoods were gonna continue to be served. They've sorted it out in the end. I think mm-hmm. they've got a good plan. 
and and the on demand service is a key part of that but when this when this first plan started on demand was not a picture i mean that's how fast things have been moving you know in the pat in the last little while you know 5 years ago a, a robust on demand system that worked was a bit of a dream um and now they're they're almost everywhere i mean we had dial a bus but not quite the not quite the same no, it's not. And, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a famous consultant who shall not be named, um, who, you know, uh, poo pooed on demand service as dial a bus with an app. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, to the, to the casual observer, it looks like dial a bus with an app, but dial a bus never had the power of the scheduling algorithms that the apps have in them today. And the, the scheduling algorithms that are built into most of the apps, Pantoniums, Vias, uh, Ridecos, are, are powerful calculators that was never available in the, in the um, you know, the dial-a-ride system, which was basically just a, a yeah. human brain, um, you know, whiteboards and a sticky note trying mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, trying to sort things out. So they are dramatically different than the... Um, uh, but the, the intent, the intent, the intent and the, is the intent, the user the perspective. It's similar. Yeah. Yeah. And from a scheduling perspective, uh, you know, there's nothing to do because right? yeah. it, it's all done and it's all done in the app. <laughs> right. And some work better than others. Um, but, um, you know, it's uh, and partially, you know, you get what you pay for. Um, but, yeah, it's a long way from dial ride. Wonderful. Thanks, Lorenzo. It was good to see you. Yeah, likewise, Dennis. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with everybody here. I poached in on the Guelph session, but uh, I know Marty, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other questions anybody want to jump in with? Otherwise, we'll... Uh... <laughs> Karen says she misses transport future sessions. <laughs> Steve, I was just wondering what what is the modal split right now in Guelph? Are we, you know, pre-COVID, was it like four percent or were we doing better than that? Uh oh my goodness. I I need to look at the transportation master plan update that's up right now with their survey and see where we were, but I think we were at six. Or okay. four, somewhere around there. I was going to say probably, probably around five. I would have yeah, guessed. Yeah, I would say yeah. Right in the middle. Yeah. yeah. You know the and, there's and a guy. Side. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, there's just uh, engineer is no longer with the city retired, but uh, he told me back in '92 they were trying to the target was 15 percent, and so we're I think that's still maybe the target. What's the heights per capita? Uh, I'd, I'd have to check, but the last time I looked, I think, you know, Guelph does fairly well with the student ridership. I think it's 60, 65. Well, yeah. that's not bad. That's yeah, no, it's, it's not. It's, uh, yeah, it was 60% for right for students and 40 for the rest of the citizens. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, rides per capita, I think, is, is, in, the, um, is in the 60, the 60 range. And if you take the students out, like during the summertime, it's real fun. <laughs> yeah. or, I, or during I, <laughs> or during COVID. Yeah, I enjoy my yeah. bus rides right now because there's no students, you know, yeah. making it late. <laughs> I'm just always thinking, like, how how do we increase the modal <laughs> split when uh, you know they're building twenty million dollar parking structures downtown and uh, expanding. I never understood why Speedvale doesn't have a bus right along the route, but I guess that's a scheduling thing. <laughs> or maybe we at just don't at a glance, I'm 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 not sure either. Although I I think part of it is that Speedvale doesn't have a lot of exposure to the neighborhoods that it borders. In terms of um, in terms of your, accessing, like your ability to walk out to speed to Speedvale. Hmm. I think that's part of it. Um, pretty major arterial is yeah yeah the well that the federal funding that uh has been on given the west end. 
the federal funding that's been given by um, Ottawa there is going to have a route on Speedville. Um, was scheduled for 2023, but I don't know where things are right now because of COVID. So, 2019 linked trips per capita is about 44, Nathan. Um, unlinked trips, total boardings, boardings per capita is, is up about 65. I guess that that sounds pretty good, but it, like for six, we have sixty buses, and that's uh, are they running right now? Obviously, running. What are we down? Are we down still ninety percent or? Interesting. You know which city was the top city in nineteen fifty? Hello. Toronto. No, Vancouver. <laughs> all went down the hill. We had the best <laughs> streetcar system, the best interurban system per capita in Canada. We were the top city in 19, up to 1950. Went down the hill, they took away the streetcars, the interurban, and now we are number four. To all, I mean, otherwise number three now after Montreal and Toronto. It's a disgrace. <laughs> I think all the systems were better 70 years ago, probably. Uh, I hope we can hit 10% in my lifetime here in Guam. All right. Sorry, let's just... <laughs> 